right. Welcome to everybody who's joined us on Facebook and all of our participants who are pouring in uh, to on our Zoom program. Before I introduce our distinguished speaker, I will start as we always do with our land acknowledgement. Crow Canyon Archaeological Center acknowledges the Pueblo, Ute, Paiute, Diné, and Hickory Apache people on whose traditional homelands our institution sits. Our mission-related work is not possible without Indigenous people in the past, present, and future, and we respectfully recognize and honor ancestral and descendant Indigenous communities for their contributions to all of humankind. Kirk Canyon is grateful to all indigenous people and we support the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections and sacred lands. Thank you to all of our partners for supporting us for 40 years and still going. Uh, so this is pretty exciting today. This is uh, one of our first Thursday uh, webinars that we are doing, we've been doing all year in honor of our 40th anniversary. Uh, and our first Thursday speaker, you can see him in the corner. We'll introduce him in a moment. Um, we, we are having our 40th anniversary conference in October, uh, also aligned with the eclipse. So that will be uh, exciting. Really looking forward to it. Um, we are on a wait list, but uh, do go ahead and uh, and and check that out if you want to be on the wait list. People do drop out. Um, Scott is also an author in our upcoming uh, book that we're releasing for our 40th anniversary year, Research, Education, and American Indian Partnerships at the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center. Uh, we're, that should be coming this month. We are incredibly excited about it. It was a, a long time in the works. And you can check out the link below uh, to see more of our 40th anniversary activities. And Thank you, thank you, thank you for everybody who donated. As you know, Crow Canyon is a nonprofit. Uh, we are almost entirely supported by philanthropy uh, in recent years and in for in the years that are coming. And uh, we we can't do it without you. Uh, and Scott will be pleased to know that many people made donations uh, in honor of his talk today. So please, thank you, thank you, everyone. We need you. <laughs> Uh, as always, at any time during Scott's presentation, you can go ahead and please put your questions in the Q&A. We will get to them. Uh, we don't want them to get last, lost in the chat as people are chatting. And if Zoom is giving you some trouble, uh, you can head on over to Facebook. And we also will be have this up and running on our YouTube channel. Coming up in the next couple of weeks, next week, Dr. Elizabeth Lynch talking about bedrock groundstone features, landscape, social identity, and ritual space on the high plains of Colorado. And then the week after that, Gardens in the Sand, Historic Early Landscapes in the Southwest with Baker Morrow. So please, please keep joining us. So without further ado, I'm I'm just I'm really excited. One of the one of the best things about uh, moderating this webinar series are all of the new, incredible, up and coming scholars I get to meet, but uh, even more so old friends and colleagues uh, that I can't believe sometimes uh, how long we've all known each other. Um, and I'm so, so honored to have to have Scott uh, here today. As people probably know, Scott is an associate professor of anthropology at Boulder. Uh, he's also a research associate at the Crow Canyon uh, Research Institute and an external professor at the Santa Fe Institute. And as we were chatting about as we got started, he is also the director of the Center for Collaborative Synthesis in Archaeology within the Institute of Behavioral Sciences at UC Boulder, uh, something that is taking up a fair amount of his time uh, at this at this juncture in his career. Uh, Hopefully you have read some of his books. I wanted to hold up uh, my copy of his uh, first award-winning uh, publication that uh, is now taught in graduate, stu graduate school courses uh, all over and uh, here at Kirk Canyon, enormously influential uh, in the last uh, 10, 12 years now uh, of the discipline since its publication. Uh, more recently, he has also uh, published Painted Reflections, Isometric Design in Ancestral Pue uh, Pueblo Pottery, and Reframing the Northern Rio Grande Pueblo Economy. So please, uh, you'll want to check out all of Scott's books after you have seen his, his presentation, if you haven't already. Scott, thank you so much for, for coming for our, our anniversary webinar celebration and uh, talking about your work. Thanks, Liz. You're welcome. Uh, it's great to, great to be here. Um, uh, I, let me, I'm going to look at the, let's see if I can see the list of people here. I suspect there's a few people that I recognize. Uh, yeah, it's fun <laughs> to see the list of folks that are here, I, even though I can't see your faces. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is really great. 
Uh, I'm going to, let's see, I'm going to set up my screen share, which is a multi-step process. So hang on one second. There we go. Hopefully that is coming through. All right. Uh, can you see the title slide? All right, Liz. It looks perfect. And okay. it's a beautiful All slide. Right. Thanks. All right, so I'm um, gonna head out. Well, thank you. Thanks for being here today. What I wanted to do is, uh, in honor of Crow Canyon's uh, 40th anniversary uh, and the volume that uh, we've all been eagerly waiting for for uh, some time now, uh, I wanted to share uh, uh, a version of the essay that I prepared for for this volume that'll be coming out later this month. Um, and you know. If this ends up being an advertisement for the book and it encourages a few of you to purchase it, that, then I will, I think, I've, have done my job. Uh, but, you know, you shouldn't buy it just for what I'm going to say, uh, because uh, uh, Crow Canyon has been uh, a real magnet for, for outstanding archaeologists uh, and Indigenous people working on uh, history and heritage in the Four Corners for four decades now. And... Uh, there are essays by all of these people. Well, many, many, I would shouldn't say all, but many, many of the of the key figures in the history of Crow Canyon research uh, have essays in this volume. Uh, it's uh, it's a really exciting uh, summary and synthesis. And you might think of it also as sort of like a springboard uh, that brings together uh, what Crow Canyon has accomplished in its first 40 years uh, and uh, hopefully uh, helps uh, set up the center and its supporters for, for the next. So, um, so these are just, this is my contribution to that conversation uh, about the big picture and the long term at Crow Canyon. Uh, and uh, my, my essay, uh, as you might have gleaned from the title, um, tries to bring together two of what I think are the most important uh, intellectual trends in archaeology in the U.S. Southwest today. So the first one is uh, the recognition following passage of the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act in 1990 and uh, subsequent regulations that, that archaeologists working in the U.S. Southwest are working with the cultural heritage of, uh, of U.S. citizens that have been historically uh, excluded and marginalized from broader U.S. society. Uh, you know, archaeology started in North America basically with non-Indigenous people who were curious about the uh, ancestral remains that they encountered as they moved across the landscape as, as settler colonialism proceeded across the United States. And uh, much of that effort was done uh, separately from uh, the dis living descendants of the people that created these remains. Uh, and uh, Indigenous people have 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 made very important critiques of archaeology, uh, uh, pointing out these issues with the with the history and origins of the field, and they archaeologists of, of my generation and the ones below it and all of us are really grappling with those critiques and thinking about how to move forward in a productive way. Uh, given given the reality that that what archaeology has traditionally the way archaeologists have traditionally operated has at times caused harm to contemporary uh, indigenous people and communities. Uh, so how to respond productively to this to this moment, I would say, is one of the key 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 uh, issues that archaeologists uh, are grappling with today. The other one, which is really quite different, is is a movement to well, it seems different, but I want to make a case actually that maybe it's not. Uh, but on the surface, it appears different. And when that the second movement is this uh, increasing um, interest in uh, making making the results of archaeological research more relevant for the present and the future. Uh, you know, you might say that uh, you know the, a traditional view of archaeology is one of you know solving mysteries or uh, writing narratives of the past, uh, learning about the past, uh, and often doing it for its own sake. You know, there's there's an idea that that knowledge is a value in and of itself, and that it's not really an archaeologist's job to think about uh, what the relevance or value of that knowledge would be for society today. Uh, 
So here's an example of, of one recent study that is, has been trying to uh, go a little bit beyond just uh, telling historical narratives and try to uh, leverage archaeological evidence in ways that are uh, uh, helpful for, for, for example, uh, forestry management uh, today in the U.S. Southwest. This is a, a, a chart from a paper by Matt Liebman and others. Uh, it shows the, the red bars show years in which there were uh, extensive fires in the Hamas Mountains. Uh, and then there you can see there's gray bars that show little isolated fires and uh, darker bars for small fires. These are reconstructed from fire scars in uh, in trees that are growing in the Hemis Mountains. Uh, and what you can see here is uh, during the era of indigenous occupation of the Hemis Mountains, uh, there were a fairly large number of isolated and, and fires, but not, you know, occasionally an extensive fire, but not that many large ones. Uh, but following the removal of indigenous people from this landscape, there was a period of more intense, more, more frequent and more intense larger fires uh, that seemed to result from essentially the removal of uh, indigenous residents as managers of that landscape. And then uh, after around 1900, you can see the disappearance of fire altogether from modern uh, fire suppression era uh, efforts, which of course, if you were to continue this chart just a few more years in the future, you would see a bunch of really big uh, red bars again, as the fuels have built up to the point that it's no longer feasible to uh, to keep those big fires down. Uh, so, you know, these studies like this are are trying to bring uh, archaeological evidence to bear in discussions of contemporary uh, social issues. In this particular case, it's about uh, proper ways to manage uh, forests uh, for human and, and uh, other for sorts of uses. So these two trends are really, they're quite different uh, in some ways. Uh, but what I want to suggest to you today is that actually I think there's a deeper way that these two trends could be brought together to give the field a coherent orientation moving forward. Uh, you know, you might think that that folks interested in the contemporary relevance of archaeology and maybe the, the social science aspect of it uh, would be pushing in a different direction from researchers that are most interested in the uh, indigenous heritage side of archaeology. But what I want to suggest to you today is that I think these two trends can come together. And I think the key way to do it is for archaeologists to think about the archaeological record as indigenous people have been for a long time. Uh, so what do I mean by this? Um, what I'm going to do is, is share with you some of, the, some of the general things I've learned from spending uh, lots of time with, uh, with uh, community members from many different tribes at ancestral sites over, I don't know, however many years of my career now. Liz was talking about how how old we're all getting, I don't know, what is it, 30 years maybe? Uh, maybe not quite, 25. Um, at least that's my story. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's 30. <laughs> all right, fine. Uh, I'll, share, so I'll share some of the things that, that, that uh, I feel like I've learned myself from uh, spending time at ancestral sites with, uh, with indigenous people. And, uh, and then I'll try to make a case for how uh, a wider ar archaeologist thinking about these places more the way uh, indigenous people do would be very helpful for uh, improving the contemporary relevance of what we do. Now, I also i i don't want to i don't want this to seem as an overgeneralization. I, I'm not trying to speak for uh, uh, you know entire indigenous communities or tribal groups. Um, uh, there are of course many different views about everything uh, in. Uh, in the in indigenous communities, just as there are different views about everything in any community. So I'm not, I don't want to uh, speak for anyone here. This is mostly my own perceptions of uh, patterns of, percep of, uh, of indigenous perceptions that I've seen over the years. So the first point uh, I'd want to make is, is that uh, in my experience, indigenous people view ancestral sites not as places that are finished. Uh, they view them as places where the ancestors are still present, where the spirits of the old ones are there, uh, and where one can um, can be with them if one's uh, heart and mind and senses are open to it. Um, of course, you know, in places like this, the, you know, these amazingly preserved cliff dwellings in Southeast Utah, it's very it's very easy to 
perceive uh, you know, the closeness with the, the ancestral uh, indigenous people here. Uh, but this is true at all sorts of uh, ancestral sites. Um, uh, when, when, in my experience, when, when community members visit ancestral sites, the, the attitude that's adopted is one of being a guest in someone's home, uh, where uh, the, the residents of that place, their spirits are there, uh, and as a result, it's important to behave uh, politely and appropriately uh, as you would if you were walking into someone's home today. Uh, and uh, so often uh, tribal members will uh, announce themselves uh, to the residents. They will offer, give a gift in the form of some cornmeal uh, to the people who are there and ask permission to enter before going into these places. Uh, so the key point here is that the that the actions of the ancestors are still apparent and the spirit of the ancestors are still apparent uh, in ancestral sites. They are there today. They, these are not finished places of the past. They are living places in the present. A second uh, I don't know, generalization I would make is, is that ancestral sites demonstrate the, the long-term consequences of desired behavior by the ancestors for contemporary community members. Uh, you know, when I was learning how to do archaeology and going to visit uh, uh, archaeological sites, all of, you know, all the archaeologists I was with would always get to a site, and the first thing they would do is they would look down at the ground to look at the artifacts and see what kinds of, of broken pieces of pottery or, or stone tools would be present. Uh, in my experience, um, Community members generally, when they get to ancestral sites, the first thing they do is look around. They look up to look at where the site is, where where it sits in the environment. Uh, and often I've heard people talk about how they can they can see the values and and perceptions and choices of the ancestors based on the places that they chose to live and the things they chose to do in those places. Uh, and one of the another thing that that uh, community members often comment on is uh, when we when uh, we walk around uh, places like this where there are uh, ancestral farming features from a past agricultural activity, uh, a very common uh, exclamation is, "Hey, look, they're still working." Uh, uh, and what what tribal members are saying is is that. The actions of the ancestors in preparing these mulches and fields are encouraging plant growth and associated animal uh, activity in these locations still today, centuries after uh, the, the people themselves had finished, had, had, had done those things. Uh, so there are enduring positive benefits for the world that are expressed through the behavior, the desired behavior of the ancestors that is manifest at ancestral sites. Uh, and uh, tribal members go to these places, you know, are often for inspiration about that and also to seek guidance regarding uh, proper forms of behavior in the world today. And they take lessons from the long-term consequences of the behavior of the ancestors that one can see uh, walking around in these sites. A third way that, I, that I've seen that uh, community members think about uh, uh, ancestral sites is that uh, these, these places are memory aids. Um, uh, as you might imagine, you know, in any society that has a long history, there's a lot to remember and too much for anyone to hold in their heads. There's too much even for the network of people in a community to hold in their heads. So, um, you know, indigenous communities depend upon the tangible, physical traces of the ancestors as ways of uh, uh, maintaining and also in some cases re-remembering things uh, as they go about their lives. Um, you know, example, rock, this is especially apparent with rock art, but it's true in other ways as well. Um, this, this famous panel in southeastern Utah, uh, you know, when, when community members go to see these places, um, the conversations that come up and the, the stories and knowledge that wells up inside people when they are reminded of uh, 
them through these physical traces uh, are very, very important for uh, ensuring that the uh, collected experience of the ancestors is maintained into the present uh, and, uh, and not maintained only through memory, but also through the sort of a dialogue of memory with the physical traces, uh, including places like this. A final point I would make is that when, when uh, community members go to visit ancestral sites, um, they, they view the information that they see there as, uh, as a means of providing benefit to the whole world. Uh, so it's not, you know, in, in many traditional activities that happen in, uh, in uh, communities in the Southwest, the purpose of the prayers is to is to benefit the the plants, the animals, the people, and the land. Uh, all of those things together. Uh, the human action is intended to have benefits for all the world, not just for one's tribe or for one or for just the people. Uh, and uh, so when when indigenous people visit, ancestral sites, those are the kinds of perceptions that they have. They, they pay attention to aspects of the sites that reveal ways in which the ancestors cared for the whole world, uh, not just the people. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I, 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 again, I find, I find all, all of these different dimensions to be just incredibly uh, poignant and powerful uh, ideas and uh, and ways of seeing that uh, for some reason, non-Native archaeologists have not been focused on. Uh, and I can just give you one example. Um, you know, as you all know, uh, the world is warming up through the actions, through the burning of fossil fuels that, uh, you know, in part is allowing us to have this Zoom meeting today. Uh, and uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is always working on new assessment reports. Uh, there, uh, some of these reports focus on things like um, adaptation to climate change, uh, seeking guidance and ideas regarding what the world should do or could do to uh, help it cope with uh, the changing global climate that we are creating. Uh, and I'll be honest, archaeology is shockingly absent from those conversations uh, with the IPCC. Uh, what I found looking at the, the, those reports so far is that most of the contribution of archaeology to those reports has to do with concerns about the preservation of sites, and especially threats to sites from rising sea levels, for example. Uh, this is a, 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 a figure from one such study that, that made an estimate of the number of ancestral sites that was threatened by uh, by rising sea levels due to climate change. I'm not at all saying that this isn't an issue, of course it is, uh, but it's pretty interesting that there's been, that archeologists have not been, archeologists have been interested in human ecology, uh, studies of the ways that people of the past adapted, uh, but they've tended to keep their focus on the past and not on the question of how do people adapt to a changing environment regardless of when. Um, and I, I think archaeologists have tended to, um, I think maybe it's because it feels safer, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe it's because the bar is lower. If all you're doing is, is telling stories about the past, well, if you're wrong, no one's going to be hurt, for example. Uh, but of course, Indigenous people are explaining to us, to archaeologists, to non-native archaeologists, that actually they've been hurt by doing that. So I, I think the stakes are higher for archaeology now than they were before. And I think all of us need to get comfortable with the idea that we have res responsibilities through our work and that we need to uh, do work that is engaging with uh, the things that we learn for, for a particular purpose, you know, to have a positive impact on the world that we live in now. Uh, there's been surprisingly little, little contribution by archaeologists to these sorts of questions uh, with the IPCC, even though the archaeological record is actually the most 
uh, extensive compendium of human experience and knowledge that there is. Um, it's it's in the big picture, you know, it's probably one of the least biased sources of information that we have about how humans have have uh, coped with changing environments over the years. Uh, and and yet, for some reason, archaeologists have been shy about uh, engaging with these sorts of discussions. Uh, so, but how to do that? Well, one reason maybe that that archaeologists have shied away from this is ideas that, well, you know, the present that we're dealing with today is so different from the past that that anything we could learn from the past, eh, you know, it probably doesn't even apply. Uh, and so you'll often see little charts like this. Um, this is the the black line that you can see here is the is some data collected by an archaeologist, Ian Morris, uh, in for his 2010 book that shows the population of the largest human settlement in uh, in uh, the Eastern Hemisphere uh, uh, over time from about 16,000 years ago to to the to the present. Uh, and uh, you know, there's the hockey stick, right? Uh, starting around you know around 1800 or so with the Industrial Revolution, you have this ridiculous explosion of the sizes of uh, large cities uh, that humans have created. Uh, and of course, when you look at the data like this, you go, wow, yeah, that's pretty darn different. Uh, so what exactly, you know, if archaeologists are studying societies where the largest settlements are on the order of, you know, not even 5 million, but, you know, 500. <laughs> um, are we really learning things that uh, that are relevant for the challenges that we face today? Uh, well, the thing is, if you look at these data in a little bit different way, it becomes not quite so different. Uh, here's a here's the same data, but showing it with a, a logarithmic scale on the y-axis. Uh, and when you look at it this way, what you see is a pattern of much more. I mean, there's still, of course, a little uh, an uptick with the Industrial Revolution of a few hundred years ago, but you can see that there's much more continuity expressed here. Uh, and what it suggests is that there's exponential effects, of course, uh, exponential processes involved in human affairs, but it's the same exponential processes that have been happening uh, for a long time. Uh, so, you know, I could I could go into more detail on, on this figure, but I think the key point I wanted to make is that some of these questions about whether the past and present are similar or not are really framing questions, and they have to do with how you choose to construe the evidence and the measurements and how you choose to frame the issues that you're talking about. Uh, and I, I, so I, I am, I'm actually not as pessimistic about this idea that, that uh, the pre-industrial past is, is irrelevant to uh, the future as some would be. Another reason I'm not so uh, concerned, I'm pessimistic about it is, is that in my experience, uh, I continue in my own work to encounter patterns in the archaeological record that are precisely parallel to those that one sees in uh, observational data drawn from contemporary societies. And this is just one example of something that came up recently in a study that I was working on. Um, this, is a, this is a map of a survey that uh, uh, Pueblo Pwaki community members, uh, CU students, and I did together uh, in the late 20 teens. Uh, and uh, you can see I have just all these different colors for all the different kinds of features that we identified. And uh, I've the different uh, kinds of features are indexed to the colors in these bar charts here on the left side. Uh, so what also what I want you to see is that there are these concentric circles around this the map that's centered on the main plaza of that village uh, in the south in the lower left part of the slide, or lower right, excuse me. Um, and so what I've done is I've grouped the features uh, within each of those bands going away from the site. And what you see when you do that is, for example, uh, if you look at the graph on the lower left, uh, the, uh, the average sizes of the uh, agricultural fields that we encountered in this survey uh, actually gradually get larger as you travel away from the middle of town. Uh, out to about 1,200 meters. At 1,500, they, they start to fade away and, uh, and the pattern uh, decays. But you can see this pattern of basically larger fields farther away from the middle of town. Uh, and then if you look at the, the plot on the top, 
what you see is, is the densities of these different kinds of features with distance from the middle of town. And what you see there is that the density of those features goes down. Uh, so the density gets lower and the size of the features gets higher as you go, go travel away from the middle of town. This is exactly what happens with, for example, houses in suburbia in uh, actually the front range of Denver right now. Uh, and uh, in urban geography, urban geographers have come up with models that, that discuss these sorts of things and say, well, what seems to be going on is that individuals are balancing uh, the costs of moving from where they live to where they work against the, uh, the benefits of, the, uh, of what they produce when they get to where they work. Uh, and so uh, what happens is that in contemporary cities, of course, real estate is much more expensive close to the middle of town because you're much closer to where most of the jobs are. And as you go farther out, there's less demand for land, so you can have a bigger house for the same income. Uh, in this particular case, in this ancient Pueblo community, it appears that what happened was there was a lot of demand for farmland close to the village, and so, but because it was close, it was worth it to someone to have a, a very a small field there, even if you had to, because you could make several trips a day from your house out to the field. But for, for fields that are farther away where the trips are longer and you don't want to go back and forth 10 times a day, uh, you needed to have a larger field to make it worth it. So the same dynamics that you see in contemporary urban systems are apparent in the archaeology of uh, Pueblo ancestors that you can see in places like this. And this is true for many other kinds of pat empirical patterns that archaeologists can now identify. So I actually think that there really is a rich record of transferable practical knowledge that is embedded in the archaeological record, despite the different dramatic differences in scale that we see between the past and present. Now, another point I want to make here is that, um, you know, practical knowledge is a good thing. Uh, it's, it's, we can always point to uh, the work that social scientists do and find uh, bias in it. We can find ways that people are, people can be wrong. Uh, people can do poor, poor research where the results are not very good. Uh, they can be misguided. All those things do happen. Uh, and, you know, sometimes you'll hear archaeologists say, well, you know, the, archae the archaeological record is so, is so difficult. Um, uh, it's so partial. It's so biased that, you know, doing research where you might actually tell, make a, cl a claim that someone today should pay attention to regarding how to behave uh, is kind of scary or dangerous or uh, you know, something that maybe archaeologists shouldn't do. Again, this is something indigenous people have been doing all along. Uh, indigenous people have been visiting ancestral sites, observing and learning from them, and taking what they've learned as a guide to behavior today and tomorrow. Uh, and, and the thing is, is that the world needs to integrate the accumulated wisdom of, of past people to be able to move forward well. This is just a simple chart drawn from uh, our world and data that shows some uh, changes in uh, some basic basic properties of uh, the condition material conditions of life for humans over the past few hundred years. Uh, you know, the fraction of people living in extreme poverty has fallen dramatically. The fraction of people with a basic education has gone up dramatically. Literacy is way, way higher than it's ever been. Uh, the fraction of people that live in democracies is still larger than it's ever been, even though we often wonder if it will continue. Uh, the fraction of people that are vaccinated against major infectious diseases is very high. Uh, child mortality rates in the big picture are much lower than they've been in the past. All of these things are products of the accumulated practical knowledge generated by natural scientists and social scientists. Uh, it doesn't mean that there haven't been errors and problems all along the way. There have. It doesn't mean that the researchers have, haven't been biased. They have. But nevertheless, uh, practical knowledge that is of value to humanity has been accumulated. Uh, and my view is that archaeology should not be afraid to contribute to this process in whatever ways it can. Uh, so, you know, everyone has biases, but we still need experts in every field to do their best to contribute to uh, a productive future. So, you know, 
many archaeologists are familiar with the work of uh, a cultural anthropologist named Keith Basso, who has a very famous book called Wisdom Sits in Places, which is a, a wonderful study of uh, the ways in which uh, Western Apache people um, connect with features of their homeland and landscape, connect it with stories and other forms of knowledge and ways in which the land helps to show Western Apache people how to be human uh, in the world that they inhabit. Uh, and what I'm trying to say here is that the archeological record also does that. Um, it also uh, contains information that is helpful, not only for indigenous people, but for everyone to know how to live well in the world that we inhabit. So, you know, the knowledge of the ancestors is apparent and manifest in archeological sites and it's tangible evidence of the choices, uh, successes and failures and the overall accumulated wisdom of, of the ancestors. Uh, so, and again, for indigenous people, visiting ancestral sites provides guidance and direction. That's one of the reasons to go visit these places is to seek that and to obtain it. Uh, and so the key point here is that I don't see any reason why archaeologists should not be a part of this process, should basically orient what they're doing toward the same sorts of uh, values and purposes that indigenous people have always had for visiting ancestral sites. So what I'm talking about here is investing in in increasing practical knowledge of the human condition from working and observing and working with and learning from the ancestors through the physical traces that are in ancestral sites. This is not knowledge for its own sake. It's not stories of the past just to have a story. Um, what I take from the indigenous critique of archaeology is that reconstructing the past for its own sake is not a good enough a reason to do archaeology. Uh, what I what what I hear is that there needs to be a reason for what we're doing. There needs to be some sort of benefit that comes from the imposition upon the ancestors that archaeologists make by investigating ancestral sites. So, for the last part of my talk, I want to just share a few ideas about directions in which. Um, archaeologists and uh, indigenous experts can work together to uh, to bring an integrated view, uh, integrated indigenous knowledge and archaeological data together to uh, advance our understanding of the human condition. And these are just a couple of ideas. I'm sure there are others. You probably will think of more uh, just in listening to these. So I'm not at all suggesting that this is a research design, but this is just some ideas to just get some thoughts going. Um, so one key point here, and, and it's something that I think has been a barrier to, to the integration of uh, uh, oral, oral history and archaeology, is the oral histories of different tribes are not identical. They say different things about what happened in history. And this is especially true with regard to, uh, to what we know today as Chaco Canyon, in uh, uh, the place I'm sure many of you are familiar with. In the, in the past, many archaeologists have, have taken the fact that oral traditions don't all say the same thing as evidence that those traditions are not evidence uh, related to what happened in places like Chaco. Uh, I think there's a better way to think about it, which is that all of these different traditions reflect different points of view about things that happened in the past in the Chaco world. And if you start to think about them that way, then the differences in what different stories from different communities say about Chaco and differences between those stories and what, let's say, uh, an outsider that's not a community member would perceive about the archaeological record of Chaco tells us a lot about the uh, subjective perceptions of the people that were involved in the Chaco world. Uh, and in my, in my mind, you know, a deeper engagement with this variation in the uh, oral traditions and the archaeology and letting those differences between them, not expecting them to all say the same thing. Uh, you know, if you think about it, with, with important uh, events in our own society today, people from different political points of view will have different stories about the same events as to why they're happening, about what the events even are. 
Well, that's probably true with the uh, oral histories of indigenous people as well. I mean, it must be true of those as well. So that should become a strength that archaeologists leverage uh, working with community members to deepen our understanding of social and the social and political dimensions of life in the past. I think there's a ton of work to do here that, uh, that, that is really, we have barely scratched the surface of it. Another example is, um, is thinking about the process of cultural change and innovation. Um, you know, many times over the years, I visited ancestral sites in the Four Corners uh, with, uh, contempor with Pueblo people who have talked about how these sites reveal and manifest the story of the ancestors gradually creating, imagining and creating the institutions that are needed for a functioning community to exist today. Uh, and I've often seen uh, community members be really quite inspired by uh, their perceptions of the of the efforts, uh, the struggles, the false starts of the ancestors in trying to solve the sorts of social integration problems that that every every community has to deal with. Um, in this process, it's almost always it's almost always a process of uh, people re rearranging existing ideas in new and productive ways uh, that helps to try and solve these problems. Um, Cultural change is usually a process of recombination more than it's a, a process of invention from a whole cloth. Uh, and I think we, you know, we know that that happens, but, but which sorts of recombinations and what sorts of ideas tend to work better or tend to uh, be more productive in helping uh, societies overcome enduring challenges that they face? Uh, to me, that's a really interesting question. This is just one example of some research that uh, students and I have done over the years where we've We've investigated um, uh, the uh, kinship terminologies of uh, Tanoan languages and found evidence that uh, in, uh, in the old days, long ago, uh, the people speaking Tanoan languages had a kind of family structure where communities existed of basically two clans, uh, you know, one, and the members of the two clans, let's call them summer and winter, were not, were, had to, you couldn't marry someone of your own clan, you had to marry someone of the opposite clan. Uh, and uh, we've developed some ideas which suggest that that the some of the divided communities of the of southwestern Colorado, like San Canyon Pueblo that you see here, uh, were communities in which uh, you could think about there being two clans like that. Uh, but what's happened is over time, uh, you can see the evolution of the terms in these languages to be abstracted from specific kinship relationships to general um, to general village occupancy. So uh, in a in a Tewa village today, for example, um, every one of the generation older than you is referred to as an aunt or an uncle, uh, regardless of how closely related to you they are, uh, or uh, someone that's especially old will be be a grandparent, uh, regardless of how how uh, related to you they are. Um, and uh, from a variety of uh, studies that that I've done that that you, know, you could read about if you wanted to, um, it seems as though uh, uh, Tewa people in particular evolved from a world in which there was two, a dual clan type of community to one in which that became a model for paired communities where instead of it governing marriage, you had uh, you know two groups, we call them moieties today, uh, each of which had their own village for a time uh, before coming together to make uh, one village with summer and winter people that you see today. Uh, so this is just an example of, of what Levi Strauss referred to as bricolage, the rearrangement of existing ideas to help solve uh, solve problems in society. Um, I suspect that there's, there's more examples of this sort of process that uh, are only revealed by integrating uh, in, uh, indigenous knowledge, uh, linguistic information, other things with the archeology. span uh, A third example uh, that, that I'm especially excited about is, is Thinking about the what it means to have a society where that is governed by indigenous values and what sort of difference it makes in the big picture. Um, uh, folks in indigenous communities often, you know, utter this phrase, we belong to the land. And, and what, what I think they're trying to express by this is that the human community is a part of nature, not separate from it. 
Um, and as a result, humans have responsibilities to uh, and also benefit from the people, the plants, the animals, and the land. Uh, it's really the 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 Western humanist tradition is really quite different, where there is a strong separation of the human community from nature. Uh, you know, uh, man versus nature quote you know is a a common trope in Western literature. It's not really the point of uh, indigenous culture, as far as I've come to understand it. Uh, but the question is. So how much does it? How much? How how much difference does it make, and in what ways? Um, if if the if a society is organized in such a way where the human community does not view itself as being separate from nature and views itself as being responsible to it, uh, where the earth is is your mother, uh, not something that's foreign to you, where you belong to the land rather than you own the land, uh, and. I know, I know that uh, indigenous uh, community members that I've talked with over the years, I'm, I mean, I'm predisposed to think it makes a big difference, but I can't say that it's been measured very carefully. Uh, and I think um, if, if the values of indigenous communities are going to help contribute to making a better future, I think one of the things archaeologists can do is investigate the big picture impacts of those values for things that the larger world cares about. Uh, so once one project that uh, I'm involved with uh, right now is working toward, you know, trying to do some of those measurements. Uh, uh, what, we're, what we're working on with the funding from NSF is a project that is bringing together two big, uh, big data platforms. One is called Cyber Southwest. Uh, it's a it's a database of information on the, the settlement history of Pueblo people from basically from Phoenix to uh, Durango. And then, well, what, what did Linda Cordell say? Durango to Durango, uh, Mexico. It doesn't quite go that far south, but it does, and it does, it, it does roughly go from uh, uh, Las Vegas to Las Vegas. Uh, but uh, we're working just on integrating the settlement history of the Pueblo world that you can see on this little watershed map here with um, with tree ring records that help us to reconstruct again the environment experienced by uh, these folks. Uh, and our, our goal is to assess how uh, you know variation in the ways that uh, Pueblo ancestors arrange themselves on the land uh, affected their ability to weather a changing environment. Uh, this little uh, viewer here shows you the study area that we're working with. it's it's huge. And this is this is a plot showing the population density of each of the inhabited uh, small watersheds uh, within uh, the study area at uh, I think between 1250 and 1300, so that you can see the lighter the lighter color is a higher density. So we're we're working on bringing all of these things together to investigate these questions, the ways that indigenous values play out in the big picture uh, at a really large scale. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited for this work and hope that um, hope that it'll lead to some exciting outcomes. So to, to work toward a wrap up here, um, this phrase is something I've often heard in 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 attending traditional activities in in villages in New Mexico. Um, the whole thing is a prayer. Uh, and, and this is often referred to in association with the feast days where uh, the Pueblo opens itself to to non community members to visit to come and eat and to participate in the ceremonies to take part of uh, expressing the ideal values of the world as Pueblo people see them. Um, and, you know, all of those activities that go on in, uh, in the feast days in villages uh, are, are intended to encourage the world to be a little bit more the way, uh, closer to the ideals of the community. Um, and, uh, you know, I regularly hear uh, community members say, you know, we, as our ancestors have done, so should we do. Um, so, you know, re receiving guidance from the ancestors is one of the things that goes on in traditional activities. Um, uh, it, it shows up in different ways than, than just visiting uh, ancestral sites, and I won't get into that today. But, um, you know, receiving guidance is, is one of the points of uh, of traditional activities. And again, the idea here is to consider everyone and everything in this process, not just me, my family, or my community, but 
but to think more broadly about the world and how to create a world of abundance for, for all things. Um, and the, so the key point here is that I think archaeology can be a part of this too. I, I really don't see any reason why uh, an archaeology oriented around these indigenous values could not be a very productive thing that would make a big difference in the world today. Uh, so that's the that's the basic argument that I'm trying to make here. Uh, and you know, rather rather than having people interested in uh, contemporary relevance and uh, decolonizing archaeology pulling in different directions or pulling the field apart, um, I think uh, the best way forward is for is for us to learn how to move forward together. Uh, with indigenous community members uh, to harness their wisdom, uh, to tell inspiring stories, but also to generate knowledge that transfers from the past to the present, uh, to think about ways of, of advancing the social science, social sciences through indigenous heritage uh, and the heritage resources and the rich record of the experiences of the old ones that have been left for us to learn from. So, um, I'll wrap up there. I, I just wanted to mention that um, you know, I, one of the one of the things that Liz mentioned is that uh, I'm involved in a in a synthesis growing synthesis center here at CU Boulder. It's called the Center for Collaborative Synthesis and Archaeology. Uh, it's a partner organization of the Coalition for Archaeological Synthesis, and uh, the kinds of things I'm talking about here is this, some of the stuff we're trying to do. So there's there's a few uh, websites here uh, that you could look at uh, if you wanted to learn more about that work. So thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for listening. I can I can have time for some questions probably if people want to ask them. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, spectacular talk as always, and just your arguments are so clear and persuasive uh, and calm that uh, it, it sometimes feels like a wonder that, that we have to have some of the discussions uh, that, that we have with various stakeholders in the discipline. I'm just gonna take moderator's privilege and ask you the first question. Um, one of the statements that you made was so uh, quietly powerful uh, that reconstructing the past for its own sake is not a good enough reason, that there has to be a reason. Uh, which very succinctly describes where we are at Kirk Canyon in our 40th year, that we are seeking to do research for very good reasons that are useful to Indigenous people and to the world. Uh, mm -hmm. And we feel that sense of responsibility uh, and reciprocity. Uh, you talked about the possibility that uh, these perspectives uh, had the, of course, ha have the potential to pull the field apart. And we have noticed, of course, as we've embarked on this and been very saddened to get some very angry uh, reactions from some of our longtime colleagues. And I'm just, from where you sit, particularly in, in the university system and in these other projects, do you think that these trajectories of the discipline that you describe are likely to result in a rift similar to what has happened at various points in the history of archaeology, or do you have the sense that people are going to come together? Well, if I wasn't concerned about it, I wouldn't have written about it. Right. <laughs> so, so Thanks, John. Right. Yeah, yeah. It is a concern yeah. of mine. Um, yeah. I, um, I, you know, I guess all I can say is that is that in my experience, I don't see I don't see a wall. Uh, between those things. Um, the other, I guess the other thing I would say is that um, for for me, what what is just so important is remembering that we're that um, I don't know, you know, when I went into archaeology, you know, the idea was, oh, archaeology is fun because you don't have to deal with people. You don't, you know, you don't have to, you know, and it's actually, well, I know I actually you do. <laughs> and uh, and and that's good. It's as it should be, actually. You know, that realization yeah. is important. Um, uh, I don't see any reason why we can't advance the social science of archaeology in a way that uh, that uh, people in descendant communities find valuable. But it's not going to come from archaeologists imagining it themselves. It's going to come through uh, archaeologists being in relationship with the uh, with the descendants and with uh, the folks whose ancestors created the material. Uh, and it's going to take a point of view where archaeologists acknowledge that, you know, the ancestors left information for us to learn from, uh, and uh, and it's important for us to do that in a respectful way that acknowledges uh, the potential for for misstep and and 
and the potential for harm in that process too. I mean, it's about being responsible. Uh, it's about recognizing that we have a responsibility. Uh, and uh, I just think we just shouldn't be afraid of it. We just need to acknowledge that it's true and uh, and embrace it and uh, and learn how to move forward together. Thank you so much, Scott. Uh, it, inspirational answer, and I, you've almost—I uh, mean, you've touched on an answer to the to a question from one of the viewers, and I wanted to just put it out there uh, in case you wanted to extend that a little bit. And one of one of our folks asks, uh, "What do you feel is the most crucial part of the collaboration with Indigenous people?" I think. Knowing, knowing, in my own experience, what I found is that spending time with community members and learning about their lives uh, and about things that are of interest to them and important to them is, you know, probably the most important thing. Um, and I mean, you know, archaeology is still a field that has discipline specific knowledge that it takes a while to learn how to do. Um, you know, the, the, the process of turning the bits and scraps that happen to remain, uh, physically remain at ancestral sites and turning that into reliable measures of past the ancestors' behavior for us to learn from is not straightforward. It takes, you know, it, it, archaeologists have learned how to do that better. And I'm not saying we've solved it all, but we've gotten better at it and we continue to get better at it. Um, that is training, you know, it's like, you know, there is something there. The question is, to what purpose are those skills and knowledge put? Um, and so th th what archaeologists do with the things that the field has learned how to do, I think needs to emanate from uh, from discussions and understandings uh, of, of what the interests of uh, descendant community members are, uh, but also the interests of society. You know, I mean, I... I Again, I think the way I think of it is that uh, the ancestors have very graciously left a rich record of their of their lives and activities and struggles and successes for us to learn from in the hopes that we will do better. <laughs> and um, and I would like for archaeology to be a part of that process. I, and I'm not saying I know exactly how in all ways it will work would work out. And I can't say it would always be successful or that archaeologists wouldn't do something wrong. Uh, or something that ends up being harmful. But I think moving forward with that being the spirit of what we're doing, uh, I think is is the key thing. Have, have a good heart. Uh, mm -hmm. um, I think we have time for, for one last question uh, that I think would be uh, useful for, for folks who want to move forward in this direction. Um, the question is, are there any other universities or institutions or programs that stand out in your mind that are doing the work to shift their thinking uh, and include uh, indigenous perspectives that uh, that they could investigate. You can probably guess that my own institution is uh, doing some of that. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, all, all the in my experience, uh, this is something that's on the minds of of uh, graduate programs everywhere, actually. Uh, so, um, if if that's what the question is about, I think uh, I think most graduate programs have faculty that are concerned about these sorts of things. Now you'll hear different points of view about how to how to uh, you know work through these issues uh, and uh, so you know the 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 view that I've expressed is by no means the one that all archaeologists might have. I wouldn't presume that, or that all indigenous people have. I mean, you know, that's another thing I want to make clear here is this is my own view of a proposal for how to bring together these different things. I'm not at all saying that I've done a public opinion survey of members of twelve tribes and you know. 80% approve and 20% you know nothing like that this is just my <laughs> no. own Good. this is my own my own way that i put together what i've experienced with regard to these issues and i think i would welcome you know discussion and debate with with uh, community members about what would what's productive or not about that way of thinking um i i think that's another part that i think is important is um it's important for 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 archaeologists and community members to be engaged together in moving forward with the with the specific knowledge that they bring uh, to the to the issue. Um, you know, uh, an archaeologist pretending like 
you know, archaeologists don't have methods or other things that help us to, right. uh, again, translate the archaeological record into useful observations. That's kind of silly. Um, but also, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 the knowledge maintained, I mean, I continue to be just impressed again and again at the depth of the knowledge that is maintained in indigenous communities and how much of that history is known uh, in, in different in various ways uh, or from certain points of view. Um, and so the you know the question is how to move forward in relationship in such a way that that those things can come together. Um, so I, you know I don't know I think I think a lot of programs are, are grappling with these things so I I, I wouldn't be too concerned about it actually at least anyone that works in North America um, you know this is this is what we're talking about. Fantastic. And you know what you said about this is this that you're offering some ideas, some some practical ways to to move in this direction. That's huge. We're uh, very grateful for that, and that's something we've been looking for uh, among other scholars, indigenous scholars, for uh, how to move forward. And uh, from our perspective. Um, well, we can't be paralyzed, right? We don't be afraid of the critique. Don't be afraid of of the bias that we all have in some way or another. Let's try to to recognize it, um, not be defensive, and move forward, and and just try mm -hmm. to do the best we can to do good in the world mm -hmm. and to live up to our responsibilities. So, mm -hmm. your 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 practical well, suggestions course, are, are much yeah, appreciated. you know, and of, of course, of course, um, one of the most important things the field can do is to take steps to make sure that that the people that do archaeology in the future look like the population of the United States, uh, you know, right. and right. more closely awesome. reflect uh, the composition of, of the US. And so, of course, that means more indigenous people doing archaeology, but it means more people from all sorts of backgrounds uh, doing archaeology, you know, in an ideal world, I would like for the field to get to the stage, you know, there was a time where it was American Indians and archaeologists were put parallel to each other as though Archaeology was an identity the same way a tribal identity was. And it's like, I would I'd like to imagine a day where that doesn't make any sense anymore. Uh, because, because the idea of, of archaeologists being separate from that or being parallel to uh, a tribal identity doesn't make sense. Uh, let's hope we all get there in our lifetime. I think it'd be great if we did. We me too. And uh, we're a couple of minutes over and we want to be respectful of your time so that you will come back. So thank you so much, Scott. And thank you to, to our extremely large viewership and for your questions and comments. And Taylor will make sure that uh, uh, that that Scott gets some of your some of your compliments and, and questions as well and and passes out uh, uh, his contact information. Sorry, Scott. So <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, have a wonderful evening to you and everyone else. And we will see you soon. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, everybody. Thanks it was so really much, nice, Scott. To see you. nice to talk to you all. I wish I could have been uh, in a room to see your faces, but that's OK. This is this is not so bad. Now I can go home. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Have a great All night. Right.